there was one time, I remember, where I was caught looking down at my chart for something. I was trying to find something, and I missed the snap. I missed, I missed half the play. I was looking down, and I look up, and I said, uh-oh. I said to myself, I, I, well, all of a sudden, Butch starts pointing like, a, you know, unbelievably. And he pointed, the quarterback gave it to the running back. Then he went around the end. Then he fumbled the football. And Butch is signaling like this. I called the whole play without having ever seen it. Beat Everyone is brought to you by Broadway Joe's Fantasy Sports. Inspired by football legend Joe Namath. Embrace the thrill of daily fantasy sports like never before in a new app coming soon. Welcome to Beat Everyone. I am Ben Flanagan with AL.com, and I'm here with AL.com Alabama football writer Michael Casagrande. And we're once again back with another edition of the Golden Age with the man himself, Eli Gold. Eli, how you doing? I am well. Good to see you. I hope you've had a good week. Absolutely. Well, Eli, listen, you've had this incredible storied career. We've been over it so many times on, on all these episodes. Uh, so much has gone right for you to get where you are now, this legendary, beloved broadcaster. But as you know, on live radio, on live television, sometimes things <laughs> go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So we were hoping that you might tell us about what happens when that happens. Like, what happens when things do go wrong? How do you respond when faced with on-air adversity? Who is there to help you clean it up? So you see and hear way more than we do. It all appears to go smoothly for yeah. us on our end, but when it doesn't, what happens? Wow. Wow. I don't know if we have enough time <laughs> to discuss. Really, when things go wrong, you've got to take a deep breath and basically keep going. That's point number one. You don't want the listener or the viewer to know that. And they shouldn't have to worry about that. They shouldn't care that you're, you, know, you have this issue or that issue. They're there to hear a ball game in the toy store of life. They don't want to be bothered by by problems that you might be dealing with. Um, but the big key is to surround yourself with good people. And that's what we have done over the years, regardless of the sport. When I was doing NASCAR racing, we had a producer on our Motor Racing Network broadcasts by the name of John McMullen. And John was an unusual guy in many regards. People didn't necessarily like all of the decisions he made. I understand how that goes. We have producers just like that on uh -huh. our show. But, but you have to remember that everything he did and said was because he perceived that it was best for the network. And he had no selfish bones in him. Everything he decided to do was for the betterment of the network. So from that standpoint and the fact that he had a magnificent ear for a broadcast, John would tell me something in a, you know, on lap five, he'd jump in my ear uh, and he'd say something. And then four hours later, he'd jump in my ear again and say, remember we were talking about that earlier. And, if, and many times I wasn't going to bring that up again, but he jogged my memory. So a great producer, and I've worked with two outstanding, John McMullen being one, and our guy at, at Alabama, Tom Stipe, who has been uh, probably the best radio producer that I know I've ever worked with. And look, he does U.S. Open tennis. He does golf. Uh, he does stuff in all different countries. He's, he's all over the place. Uh, and it's not because he's a good-looking guy, although he's bearable. But no, in, in all seriousness, he's good. He's really good. And so when something goes wrong, I have Tom Stipe to talk me down off the ledge if that's what's necessary or to remind me to say something or to help me in the creative. A lot of the things I say, a lot of the stuff I've said on the air has merely been me regurgitating something that Tom has just said in my ear. Uh, 
the fans at home don't hear that because Tom can talk to all the broadcasters either collectively or individually. There are different buttons he can push uh, to talk to the color man by himself, the play-by-play -play guy by himself, the sideline guy by himself, or he can talk to everyone, what have you. Um, but a lot of the stuff I've said, a lot of those great finishes, you know, the, the, we talked about the, uh, uh, you know, me being in the shower, uh, you know, we talked about that on a, on a, on a long ago episode about coming up with things that, you know, I want to say, and I think about them in the shower on the morning of a, of a championship game. Well, a lot of that stuff is then polished by Tom Stipe. You know, the, the roses in this grand old stadium are once again crimson. You know, Tom really pointed me in that direction. Uh, you know, we had the idea, but how was it going to be presented? Uh, there were things I, I said something to somebody on the way to an LSU game. We're sitting in traffic. I was driving to the, to the uh, stadium with Tom. I was riding. He was behind the wheel. And we were stuck in traffic on Nicholson Drive, the road that goes right past the stadium at LSU. And there were these Hawaiian people. You could easily tell they were, they were Samoan. Uh, and, and they had Tua jerseys on. And they, I could, you could tell, just the whole setting. They had decorations up. It was a group of Hawaiians. And, uh, you know, so I rolled down the window and, you know, and I, I gave them a big aloha and so on and so forth and this and that and the other. And we, we chatted while we were sitting in traffic. And, uh, and as I pulled away, as we pulled away, I said, you know, I forget exactly what it was, how it came out. But I said, I need to use that on the air. That was a pretty good line, whatever I had said. And, you know, and that was that. That was probably six or seven hours before the game, you know, by the time we got there, got what have you. And I had forgotten about it. And we're doing the game, and Tua takes off with a big running touchdown. And all I hear in my ear from Tom is, use it. Use it now. <laughs> and it, I had forgotten, basically. And it was him telling me, remember what you said in the car? Use it now. And I did. And it was uh, some Hawaiian phrases and this, that, and the other. And uh, it played really, really well. So a lot of the stuff I said, a lot of those teases that were spectacular uh, were written by Tom. I would then change a word or two or three because it read, uh, I thought, a little bit, not so much the subject, but the way the words flowed. Uh, it, it would read a little bit easier for me if I did this. But uh, I thought we were a heck of a team, and he was absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. You had time to uh, use it, too, because that was the slowest 36-yard quarterback run yeah. to the end zone yes. I've ever seen Yes, in my life. exactly. So, uh, yeah, exactly. But yes, it's. Uh, but yeah, Tom was always talking to me in my ear, uh, reminding me of stuff. Not to mention the normal broadcast stuff. He'd say, you know, I need an ID, because he would be the, you know, by FAA, excuse me, FCC rules. Not that the Federal Aviation Administration would care, but FCC rules. Uh, you know, you got to give a station a chance to identify themselves. <laughs> within five minutes of the top of the hour and five minutes after the top of the hour. Well, I don't sit there looking at my wristwatch trying to remember what time it is, but Tom does. Or he has an alarm set or something, and he'll jump in my ear and say, I need an ID, or, you know, whatever it might be, or something will happen, he, and he'll, he'll fill me in, and I'll just, I don't even think about it. I just spew it right back out on the air. I trust him to that degree. Do you ever? Do we ever hear Tom Stipe on the air? Is he ever? Uh, is he's, he's he has been on occasion, uh, at at my request. Now he's on during basketball. He does commercials and scoreboard updates. That's just uh, the way they have formatted formatted the basketball broadcasts. But yeah, he's been on with us on occasion. When I asked for, you know, you know. 
Tom, what did you think? Or something, you know, it's rare. It was rare. I don't think he'd been on 15 times, if that much, in 36 years. So if it wasn't for Eli Gold, would Tom Stite be the voice of the uh, Crimson Tide Athletics? Or, uh... You never know. <laughs> I know I've gotten Tom out of some uh, traffic tickets. Oh, that's which nice. Which is good. Yeah, he got stopped somewhere. And the guy looked at, the state trooper looked at his license and said, I know that name. And he finally they talked and he said, you know, keep the keep the pace down a little bit or whatever Tom was doing. But uh, no, he's in all seriousness, though, Tom wrote and created so much of what I said. And, uh, you know, it's really just been he, he's been the best I've ever worked with. And I've worked with some great you know, I've been lucky to work on ESPN and CBS and other networks. Tom has just been the best producer I've ever worked with. Well, on the other hand, though, you know, tensions can run a little hot in a live broadcasting environment, and things can go haywire unless, you know, you've put in the preparation mm -hmm. and have, you have all the experience. Right. But can you recall any of those times? Because I think people picture something like Bob Euchre in Major League, and he's grabbing the microphone and saying, who wrote this stuff? You know, that no, kind of thing. Like, no, has there ever been a moment like that where you and Tom have, like, come to blows no, uh, off the, the air spikes, Come on. No, it's <laughs> not at all. The, you know, we had, but you're, we, best, you're still friends in the end. You're just oh working. Oh, God. But, no, we, we never uh, – we didn't get ever get chippy like mm -hmm. that. The thing we did have happen, and it's not anything personal, uh, we – you know, sometimes the rain would start pouring down. And it would start blowing in to the booth. And, you know, so I'm trying to cover up my papers. Tom concerned about the electrical pieces of, equ of equipment. Uh, you know, so we each had responsibilities. And sometimes I'd get up and, you know, we'd, he'd be talking in my ear and say, you know, do this, do that, what have you. But, no, we, uh, we, we're, we're both professionals. We've... We're, we're dear friends. We've worked together for, for so many years. Uh, we've traveled all over the place together. And, uh, no, he's, uh, you know, the only time he'd get upset at me is if I beat him to seat 1B in the airplane instead of, and he had to get in 1A. You know, we, uh, it, it was third world problems, right? But, no, it's, uh, it, we really get along. But he was so creative. He is so creative. Uh, we would sit down and and come up with ideas for these teases. You know, the, the start of the broadcast, those first two minutes or three minutes to try and hook the listener. Not that Alabama football needed any extra hooks, but it kind of, but you know, but I would have an idea, he would have an idea, and then, you know, then he would basically write it. And then I would make a few adjustments here and there, but so much of what you heard coming out of my mouth was created by Tom. It's, it's good to hear that, that, at least in some parts of our business, that we can have creative differences and not have shouting matches because yeah. goodness knows on our side of the game, we've... Uh, we've I don't think, you know, I'm sitting here just going over it in my head. I can't remember, and, and when Tom is watching this, he may call and say, hey, you remember such... I don't remember when we ever had a shouting match. Uh, it, it does, and he is just so good. We'd be doing the Nick Saban show, and something would come up, and I couldn't come up with the answer, or, or you know, somebody wanted an example of something. And next thing in my ear, you know, Tom would would be whispering something. Remember the Southern Miss game of ten years, whatever it is. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I valued him uh, as more than he knows. Sometimes I don't know if he understood and appreciated how much I valued his work and his input. Well, it sounds like y'all are just the best live broadcasters in the history of the medium because, I mean, like, it's amazing what Michael just said. That's rare. Like, that dynamic yeah, is rare you know, to, like, get along. So, because, well, I was going to ask you, though, because live, I, I can't imagine really because I, we've never done it on a, at your level, you know, especially calling like an Alabama football or Alabama sports, uh, whatever, NASCAR hockey in your case. Sure. But like I have to think like you're having to maintain poise and you're obviously professional and skilled. You've got so much experience. But when something is in your ear 
during the game and somebody is saying something when it's not the right time, right? Has that ever happened to you where you're having to call over it where it's just like, no, no, I, like, I can't be hearing this right now. I've got to focus on what's in front of me. Yeah, but that doesn't bother you, at yeah. least. You know, when people are annoying and they keep, keep cutting in and they, you can't get a word in. Like Michael? Like right, right, right now, <laughs> yeah. No, you know what it is? You just, that's your training. Yeah. You know, some people, when, when, when the producer or director get in your ear, they're all screwed up, man. If they say something, they'll stop. The, you know, it, that's new new air talent does mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. But no, Tom knew when to talk to me, and and I was blessed to be able to listen while talking, and then change direction instantly. I don't know why. It's just something I learned that. I'll tell you what, what really helped me on that. I was doing a hockey game. It was my second NHL game ever. It was the St. Louis Blues in Los Angeles against the L.A. Kings at the old Fabulous Forum in Inglewood, California. And we had a director or a producer who was really hung up on celebrities. Hmm. And, of course, at Kings games, as you'd have at Laker games and whomever, Dodger games, you'd always have celebrities scattered all about the seating area and I'd be doing the play-by-play and uh, and all of a sudden he'll say Jack Nicholson (laughs) and he'd cut to Jack Nicholson watching the puck go up and down the ice and then I'd be doing the play-by-play and he'd say Diane Cannon and he'd cut to a shot of Diane Cannon and uh, you know and and he wanted me to acknowledge who all was there not that the people in St. Louis gave a darn whether Diane Cannon was at the Kings game, but, you know, and he was so interruptive and so annoying. But that night taught me how to really keep on going and to kind of halfway tune out but listen at the same time. So I've been blessed, you know, Tom will say You're very something. lucky to be able to do that, by the way. Yes, thank you. But Tom is, uh, Michael Casagrande is here. Uh, but, uh, but Tom is, was very good at uh, knowing when to talk to you, but if he had to say something, he knew that I was going to keep on going. But again, that came because we worked together for you know nearly four decades, whatever, nearly 40 years. So uh, you know, we, we both had dark hair. <laughs> when this all started and, 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 and so on. But we had, he was so good. He is just the, the creative juices that he had. And I can't even begin to tell you how many things I said on the air that came out of his mouth. It was like he'd, he'd say it to me and I'd spit it right back out to the listener. He was just so good at that. Still is, I'm sure. I don't know what how it's working with with, with their current setup, uh, but with for me it was it was it was a godsend. Wow, sounds like sounds like a pro's pro. Yes, uh, it's good to hear. Well, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and talk about has Eli Gold ever had a hot mic moment uh, while calling out <laughs> a football game? But we're going to be back here on Beat Everyone in just a little bit. Stick with us. Back here on Beat Everyone, I'm Ben Flanagan. This is Michael Casagrande, and we're here with Eli Gold. And we're talking about what happens when things go wrong and who are the people behind the scenes that help prevent that from even happening. Uh, Eli, it's always interesting to see the cam on you sometimes. They would share from social media accounts what it looked like when you made a big call. Right. And often standing behind you is a gentleman with binoculars, and he's looking over your shoulders. And sometimes we'll see him tap your shoulder, lean down, and whisper something to you. Who is that, and what is he doing? That is Butch Owens. Um, He has threatened me not to tell his real name on the air, but he's been known universally as Butch forever. Uh, He's from Birmingham, just retired from Golden Flake. He he was employed by them for many, many years, worked for AT&T for a number of years as well. Uh, Butch came in as my spotter, my extra set of eyes in the booth, Back in my first season, he didn't start with me in year number one. 
Uh, I stayed with the folks that Paul Kennedy had used and that John Forney had used, but it just wasn't what I was looking for. It wasn't the quality of work that I was looking for. I was friends with Butch. Uh, he was a big hockey fan. I had known him when I got here. We, we met early in my time in Birmingham, and I knew that he, he loved Alabama football and wanted to be there. And, and, you know, the more we talked, the more I realized he could be a big help. So I brought him to Tennessee, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was the first game he worked with me in my first year. And uh, he's been with me ever since. I have not done a football game of any kind without Butch since then. He's been with every Alabama game, every NFL game, every arena football game uh, until now when our schedule is, you know, has been conflicted and he's chosen to stay uh, with Alabama, although he will work with me some on, on the, the JSU package and, and some other stuff, but he's, his, his number one priority has remained Alabama. But Butch is my other set of eyes. He has good eyes. He knows what I'm looking for. And over the years, we have developed this silent communication, basically. He knows his responsibility while I look for the football during the play. He's looking at the defense. He's looking at who makes the tackle. And he'll point to that guy on my chart. There's also in case I miss a block on the end uh, to free somebody to make a nice move up the sideline. You know, Butch will point to somebody and go like this. And I'll just say, and that was a great block by whoever. Because if I didn't see it or I didn't say it, you know, I, if Butch indicates it, then it happened. There was one time, I remember, where I was caught looking down at my chart for something. I was trying to find something, and I missed the snap. I missed, I missed half the play. I was looking down, and I look up, and I said, uh-oh. I said to myself, I, I, well, all of a sudden, Butch starts pointing like, uh, you know, unbelievably and he pointed the quarterback gave it to the running back then he went around the end then he fumbled the football and Butch is signaling like this I called the whole play without having ever seen it so he's like a, the ultimate Pictionary like yeah I mean he's voice. like a, he's he, he I called that entire play without ever having seen I looked up and I said oh man I'm in deep doo-doo here um, and, you know, there are times where I've made errors. We all are human. And Butch will, you know, give me this and, and point to that. He said, and, and I'd say, it up. Oh, excuse me, I said such and such had the ball. It was actually, you know, Joe Blow who had the ball. Um, Butch has just been my second set of eyes. He also does quick, quick statistics. Uh, you know, we always have a stat person or a stat monitor uh, to work, but on a, on a case of a punt, Butch can compute instantly how long the punt was and how long the return is. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, and he quickly scribbles down, you know, 48, and right in the middle of my commentary, you know, that's a 48-yard punt, and here comes Johnson. He's returning it, and uh, he returns it for 17 yards, and that's because Butch had written 17 Instantly, instantly, uh, we have a chart, numbers 1 through 100. And sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of the time, I just can't compute that. I just don't have a mathematical mind. And if the ball is taken at the 8-yard line and the play goes to the other 32, how long is that? Well, I, I can't start figuring. While I'm talking, Butch immediately points to that chart and, and points to the correct yardage. So he does, he is so, so good, so good at what he does. And, uh, you know, sometimes he'll help me, you know, when I'm, when I had my shoulder issues or when I'm dealing with my, with my illness, you know, he'd make sure I was walking steadily. If I had to come downstairs, he'd be there to, to try and make sure he could catch me if I, if I misstepped. Uh, it was just wonderful. Yes, yeah. wonderful. A, a spotter. Um, yeah, and it sounds like it's a lot of 
mind reading, shorthand. It is. Um, a lot of nonverbal communication that yeah. nobody would ever know about unless you told them. Exactly. He's uh, sometimes when he, put, I don't know why, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know why, but for, for a number of years, I had trouble saying, I don't know why, but I didn't identify and say a screen pass. I would just say it was a pass into the right flat. I just didn't, I don't know what it was. And Butch said, look, if it's ever going to be a screen pass, I'm just going to tap you on the shoulder. And I said, all right. He said, you got to say screen pass, screen pass. And I said, I know what a darn screen pass is. He said, well, why don't you say it? I said, well, I don't know. So he said, so any time from that point forward, if it was a screen pass, you'd see him tap me on the shoulder, regardless of which side he's on, he'd tap my shoulder. And I immediately said, screen pass. It was like, I was like Pavlov's dog, you know, he'd, he'd pat me on the shoulder and I'd say, screen pass. And we uh, found your, your blind spots. Screen yes. passes were yes. like it, it did, I don't know so why. It just, uh, you know, sometimes I'd say it, but most of the time, Hmm. No, I he just never like messed with you, did he? Like where it was like no. you know the, the <laughs> other team, or there was like a deep bomb, and he just tapped you on the shoulder. No, like, screen pass, screen. No, 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 okay. no, 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 yeah. no. Because that would have ended be, his tenure. Well, I'd be tempted yeah. to do that. Yeah. That's yeah, the well, difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 We'd be fired. Yeah. Uh, no, but uh, <laughs> but no, he uh, Butch is just he is he is a safety valve on so many things, uh, and you know he also listens to the sidelines. Uh, in his headphone, you know, he's hearing the broadcast, and he hears the sideline reporter, so he'll know what's going on down there, and sometimes he'll scribble me a note, you know, very, very quickly if I need to uh, know something. Uh, it, it's just a team operation, but we've been together for so long that it just worked perfectly. But between he and, between Butch and Tom, uh, I could never have asked for a better support crew. Never. So what, you know, the, we talked about the good, the fun, the the chemistry. Um, have you ever been caught with a hot mic? Have you ever uh, accidentally not gone to commercial break? And, and uh, We have gone, yeah, we've sometimes, well, we would always go. The commercials are not run out of the broadcast booth, okay? So Tom would say, you know, and out, we'd, you know, we'd be finished, whatever it is. And then sometimes it might have been left on. But no, I don't curse around a microphone. I have learned that from too many others who have. I don't say anything about anybody. I don't uh, offer societal, com you know, commentary. I don't do anything uh, around a microphone other than describe what I need to. So we've never really had that problem uh no no moments like oh i shouldn't have had that chili before this game or anything like that you know now i might have said that privately to the guys in the booth but not with the not with a mic hot but no. we never had a virally like old moment. no yeah we no. know about it by now oh, yeah. 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 yeah yeah no that's true <laughs> that's true but no it's uh that's never happened i'm i'm very very careful and whenever we would have a new person join our crew a new color man a new sideline guy whatever I would talk to them and r really emphasize, remember guys, the mic is always hot. Mm. Well, don't they turn it off during a commercial? Well, yes, they do, but for your standpoint, it's always hot. Don't say anything around the microphone that you don't want the world to hear. Uh, you know, even when I've made mistakes, and there have been a few, I, you know, I called the wrong guy scoring a touchdown one day, and... Uh, you know, I, I kind of cursed it myself, but with not a curse word, if you know what I'm saying. I didn't drop an F-bomb or an S-bomb on myself. Uh, I could have, and I wanted to, but you just don't. These microphones are not forgiving. You never been are you? you never been believed? <coughs> no. You couldn't just blame Tom or Bush for that if you called the wrong name? I could have, but I, I would. wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah well, I would. Yeah, no. Um... No, I've never been bleeped, to my knowledge. No, I, uh, you know, and I think I shared with you the one time I did use a curse word when I was doing that hockey game at the Garden, when I was talking about Robbie Fatorik with the puck, 
and I juxtaposed the first two letters there, but everybody looked at me and as if to say, did you just say that? And we just kept on going. So, but no, I, I've never been bleeped. What about major like, breaking news? Have you ever been on the air and something, you know, something outside of the stadium happened to where you, you're, I know that they're, they're famous Monday night uh, yeah, football episode John of John Lennon, Lennon was, yeah. was killed. Did, did you ever had a moment like that where you've been able to announce major news? No, not that I remember. Not that I remember. You know, I remember John Sterling, the Yankee broadcaster. Great broadcaster. Yes, a great, great broadcaster and uh, retired now, but he and he had to announce the killing of Osama bin Laden mm. on the air. And he did it uh, as a baseball broadcaster would, you know. Here's the 2-2 two -two to Stevenson. Down and away, ball three. Speaking of down and away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of close to that. Yeah. <laughs> kind of close to that. And he goes, oh, here's an interesting note. Uh, President Obama has just announced the uh, uh, capture and killing of uh, Osama bin Laden. The 3-2 is fouled away. <laughs> Yeah, it happened in Islamabad at a location in the desert. As Johnson steps off the mound, you know it was it was you have to, he worked it in, but uh, no, it's uh, I I don't believe I've ever had anything like that to think. I, I remember in two thousand nine, the one breaking news moment that I remember was during the Iron Bowl, classic Iron Bowl. You're sitting there calling it in real time, and that's the same moment that the Tiger Woods story breaks out that he's crashed his car yeah somebody swung a golf club at him something's happening with tiger woods and things that like probably that. didn't make our broadcast yeah i remember being on the line for the men's room at halftime and steve Burvine and cbs crew was in front of me and we were talking about hey did you hear about tiger woods really so, i don't know if i knew about it at the time i might have gotten it on my on my uh wristwatch which is tied to my phone but that would not have uh have warranted airtime on our football broadcast, I don't think. You mentioned sideline reporters, yeah. right? And I wonder, like, throughout the years, like, what is a sideline reporter in your mind brought to the broadcast? And who, who among those you have worked with has really stood out as a great sideline reporter? Well, Rashad Johnson was very, very, very good. Uh, Christian Miller was very, very good. Uh, what they bring is they're down there. Well, number one, they have played. For the most part, they have, you know, been there, done that. Jerry Duncan, though he was not a, a formal broadcaster per se, he was there. He'd been there. He'd done that. He'd played in an Iron Bowl. He'd played in, in a big game. So, number one, I had that to draw on them, you know, from them. But number two, they would go in and check the injury situation. And they had worked out a relationship with the trainers because with the HIPAA laws and so on, there's only so much that can be released to the media. But, you know, they made sure that, you know, at least the sideline guy could see what they were working on to some degree as they took him to the, you know, to the injury tent. And in the days before the tent, you could see him right there on the sidelines. Um, but they were they became a they they became a very valuable second color man. They weren't designed as such. They were designed to just talk about the color and pageantry on the sidelines, the emotions, what have you. But then when I had uh, you know John Parker Wilson by my side, an offensive-minded player, obviously as a quarterback. Well, if something happened defensively, I had Rashad on the sidelines. And sometimes we'd go right to Rashad to comment on what he saw. So we started using that sideline guy as a second analyst, specializing in their area of expertise. Uh, didn't always work out. Uh, we had one guy in the year when we, <laughs> in the year when we uh, were auditioning for Kenny Stabler's replacement. Snake had been cut loose, and we decided to have, we couldn't, we hadn't come up with anybody permanent. So that next season, I had 14 different color men. Wow. Every game we had, or actually I think we had, I think Tyler Watts did two games. 
Everybody else did one. We had different people every game. Difficult for them. It was it was not easy, but we worked it out fine. But uh, but we're doing you know that that deal there, and uh, we had a guy with us who was a former defensive back. And I was doing a game, and there was a great play by a defensive back. I, I totally forget the exact play. I don't even know if it was a Bama guy or the other guy. Whatever it was, it was a defensive back who made a, a superb play. And I said to my color man, I said, now nah, that's the way the coaches want to see a DB play, isn't it? And the guy looked at me, and he went, <laughs> that's, that's all he did. Didn't say a word. He just nodded. We're on radio. So I quickly hit my cough switch, which kills my microphone, and I reached over and I killed his microphone by leaning on his cough switch, and I said, you got to say something. And I let off the buttons, and he said, yeah, you know, but he was just kind of tuned out. <laughs> and uh, he, 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 did, he didn't say anything. He just agreed with me and, and, and nodded. So, you know, there have been moments like that. But, uh, you know, until now, it's not, it's not been mentioned. And I won't, I, I will not say who it was, but because uh, everybody knows him. But uh, nevertheless, it was, uh, you know, there have been some great, uh, great ways to utilize the sideline guy uh, with strategy, reportage, and the like. Well, maybe that broadcasting career didn't quite pan out. Who knows? No, it didn't. Yeah, okay. no, well, yours no. did. And Eli, thank you so much for sharing all this. We know that things like this don't happen often, obviously. We were looking for things that go wrong during your broadcast, and it sounds like not many things did. No, so, we had good preparation, yeah. you know, and yeah, there have been times when a cable would break or something. You know, I'd have to grab the color man's headset for a few seconds while Tom rewired something. But, uh, you know... Nothing that anybody would have noticed at home. You had a great run until you joined this podcast, and here we are. <laughs> well, if you have a question for Eli, leave us a voicemail at 205-523-4809. Subscribe to Beat Everyone on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. And for Michael Casagrande and Eli Gold, I've been planning it. Thank you so much. Beat Everyone is brought to you by Broadway Joe's Fantasy Sports, inspired by football legend Joe Namath. Embrace the thrill of daily fantasy sports like never before in a new app coming soon.